Welcome to Live Talks, a podcast by Live, a tech and logistics company headquartered in Abu Dhabi. On Live Talks, we tackle fintech, logistics, business, and best practices in the workplace. I'm Karim Bakhash, the VP of Strategy at Live Global, and I will be your host. You really need to establish that chemistry, that that human connection. Do we both align on the same values? Do we share the same view on where this industry and this business is going? Does it fit first in our overall overall strategy? Does it make sense? Does it overlap? Will it cannibalize our current operations? And then based on that, we start understanding if this is a good fit or not. I know how to hire for this thesis. I know how to invest. I know how my unit economics are looking like. And I have a playbook that makes sense. It's important that we align on what we need to do for them Mm -hmm. to grow and consequently help us, right? Because at the end of the day, grow, we grow, and together we're one happy family. Welcome to the inaugural episode of Live Talks, the first tech and logistic company to have their own podcast. My name is Karim Bakhash, and I'll be your host. I'm currently the head of strategy at Live Global. Before we get into this new episode, Let me explain a bit more why do we have this podcast. This is meant to be an informational session to listeners who are interested about latest technologies, latest trends, insights, and anything that's happening within that market. It is meant to be in open conversations with industry leaders, with people that have insights from that market. And uh, I'm very new at this, so bear with me in the first few episodes until I get the hang of it. Now, without any further ado, uh, let me welcome our first um, guest for this podcast. He is a colleague of mine, Nader Musaidfi, and he is the Chief Investment Officer at Live Global. Prior to Live, he was working at Hub71, Uber and RMX looking at merger and acquisitions, partnerships, investments, and corporate development. Welcome, Nader. Thank you, Karim. So the topic of our first episode is about inorganic growth. Um, When you look at growth, I mean, in a strategy, you look at growth at the beginning, uh, when you're a young company, you're focused a lot about organic growth. And this is something critical to the survival of a company when they start. However, at at any point or certain point, you start looking at inorganic growth, and it's something that naturally comes at a certain stage of a company. So maybe uh, the first question here is to Nader is, when is that point? Like, when do you get to a point saying, okay, now I need to start looking at these acquisitions? Yeah, look, I think each company has its timing for sure, right? Some companies, it took them 20 years to do, start thinking about M&A and investments. Some th- companies can start doing it in less than five. Um, but what matters and what's, what's common across all of them is that you, know, you, you start your company, and given that we're now we're in the context of tech companies and, and the entrepreneurial uh, tech space, you start a company, you have a thesis that technology will enable a certain business model that you have in mind, and then that business model will drive you know, demand and growth for you as a business. Um, clearly, the funds will come and they start fueling that organic growth that you mentioned uh, initially. <clears throat> and then as you start cracking that model, and you start getting more confident about that model and about that thesis, um, growth will, will start coming and you start growing even further and you start getting more funding. Once you reach a certain point saying, look, I know what this model looks like. I know how I'm I'm capturing markets. I've tested this in, let's say, more than one market or in several markets within the region or beyond. I know how to hire for this thesis. I know how to invest. I know how my unit economics are looking like. And I have a playbook that makes sense. Um, That's the internal readiness, if you like, of being ready to start looking at investing and acquiring. The other component, of course, is very important is when you have cash. You need to have sufficient uh, cash beyond what you need for your or- organic growth to ensure that you are able to go out and, and, and explore investments and explore acquisitions into other companies. Um, and then the third bit is, how what do you do with those companies once you finish the deal, 
right? It's not just because you're a strategic investor in this case, you're not a financial mm. investor. You need to ask a question, what am I going to do with those companies post-deal? Am I going to merge them completely? Am I going to keep the team? Am I going to keep it separate? Am I going to complement? Am I going to have a, a portfolio of companies doing different things for me as, uh, as a group? So that becomes an important question to, uh, to ask. And then, and then the important thing as well is to ensure you have a, a feedback loop uh, as you start thinking about inorganic strategy, that how does that link with my organic strategy, right? You cannot have, you cannot have two different strategies, two different um, like initiatives or, or activities going on that are contradicting each other. Correct. If you're growing in a certain place, you need to ensure that the organic growth is complemented by inorganic growth. Until you reach a stage, and some companies do that, saying, I'm no longer growing organically. My growth is purely inorganic. I'm going to keep acquiring, investing, and adding more companies to my portfolio. Uh, and that becomes a skill set and a capability on its own. Uh, we hear about these companies often, like when they reach a certain level of growth, that they just become like an acquisition machine, mm -hmm. right? All they do then is just acquire company one after another. And, and we hear some of these examples, right, uh, very often in yeah. this region and globally. Do you think there's an art behind it? I mean, is there something to make it more successful? I think so. Um, but if you look at those companies, even they had to go through the organic route initially and get a feel for what their thesis looks like and what they are supposed to be doing and what is success for them. So they've perfected that playbook. But then they said, you know what? We're just going to raise money. There's a lot of money available. There's a lot of funding that's available, a lot of liquidity the last few years that's, that came on the market down from, if you like, public to, to private investing. And they're able to raise those big monies and then go and, and acquire. So definitely that becomes a skill set and a capability that you have. So you're, you're more focused on um, looking for good companies, sourcing good prospects, as well as uh, identifying or, or evaluating the strengths and the weaknesses in those companies and how those fit into your overall strategy. So that becomes very important. And of course, the post deal uh, is, is super interesting here. So you, you can buy them and they can be doing really well, but then once they're in your group, things get lost and, and you might lose value on that deal. That company might not continue to perform. Mm -hmm. That's a big risk and, and m and as you know, from your probably background or experience that a lot of m and doesn't work. No. Just because they no. didn't know how to really get that synergy, get that partnership uh, sorted. <clears throat> and maybe on that point, do you think there is a recipe to make an acquisition successful? Maybe something that, you know, you, based on your experience, because you've done this quite a lot before and you can maybe talk about it, but is there something that you've done in the past that you say, okay, I am now confident that this will be a successful acquisition. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, looking at, for example, my time at Aramex and, and now what we're doing at Live, uh, even even more so here, you have to understand exactly what makes a business successful in the space you're, you're investing in. So in our space, you know, between order to payments to delivery, we know exactly what's, what goes on. We know what are the issues. We know what are the challenges we are solving. And we know how we've solved them because we've done that and already we proved that thesis in our markets. So when you go to another company that, that helps you plug that strategy and then help you complement that strategy, it's important to be able to really drill down, understand what is it that these guys are doing and what's that business model uh, like. So that recipe is there. And then, um, and then you want to make sure you don't overpay. I mean, strategic investors cannot afford to overpay. You're not uh, in this for a financial uh, play. So VCs and private equities, those guys come in. They're investing based on this business being exited after a few years, right? Uh, IPO or a SPAC or an acquisition, etc. If you're strategic, you have to think about how does that add value financially. And you really need to, need to be sure you're smart about the evaluation and, the, and how you're structuring the deal in a way that adds value to everybody. So you're not only maximizing value to yourself, you're not maximizing value to the seller or the, the target company, but you're really building a mechanism that one ensures that you are getting into the right partnership, but then maximizing the, the performance of this synergy uh, for the next uh, many years. So let's, let's take this in terms of how it happens, right? So you 
you identify a target, let's say, or you talk about this is a good acquisition, how do you then execute this? Like, w- w- how do you go about it? I mean, it starts it starts as a conversation, right? It's it's at the end of the day, the the way we are doing those uh, deals is it's a partnership. We are buying a certain stake, and we want to still have the founders or the leadership team being invested with us and being uh, a partner in this. So. You really need to establish that chemistry, that that human connection. Do we both align on the same values? Do we share the same view on where this industry and this business is going? And do we see merit in exploring a partnership together as two businesses? You establish those things, and then you get into a bit more detailed stages of okay, let's look at you know your business models, look at your numbers, let's let's tell you why we are a good. <coughs> investor or a strategic um, addition to your business. Why does it make sense for you to let us in? At this point in time, and then and then the rest is uh, you know uh, the usual process, right? Yeah. Due diligence, t- term sheets, uh, legalities, and so on. Maybe you can take us through like one example, a successful acquisition, and how it helped both companies thrive. Do you do you have an example that you can talk about? So I think maybe we talk about um, you know my my from my time at Aramex, for example, we the mandate for me joining that role was to how does Aramex expand from being a, a say Amina focused business to becoming a, an emerging market company and and the exercise included of course how do we think about where do we want to go in terms of geographies and markets what kind of companies do we want to buy do we are we looking for express are we looking for logistics are we looking for freight um so identifying that type type of business and the business model we're looking to acquire, what kind of um, deals do we want to create and execute? So are we buying 100%? Are we buying minorities? Are we buying majorities? That's also important because it then drives how the relationship looks like with with the uh, existing uh, principles. And then and then it's all about how do you go out and spread the word when you have a global mandate of acquisitions and investments and expansion. You really to, you need to be efficient about spreading the word and getting leads and, and prospects um, and, and, and attracting the right deal flow because it's a deal flow in the day, right? You know, we went about doing that and we focused a lot on Africa and Asia. Did a couple of deals in Australia that were very interesting. Um, and, and I know to this date, you know, a lot of these deals are still the anchor of, of RMX being in those markets. And that's because we were quite prudent about selecting companies, not overpaying for companies, and ensuring we share chemistry, we share values, and we share um, the, the right view on what the future looks like for, for that space uh, at the time. Maybe now looking at resources for inorganic growth. How do we go about that? Yeah, I think there's a few elements you have to have before you start looking at you know, going out and investing in, in the world. Um, one is... Uh, you need the deal team, so a team that's able to go out um, and represent you on the or inorganic side of things. So someone who can sit with another company, be able to present the story of what you as a buyer or as an investor, uh, strategic investor, are doing um, and establish those connections and that network in, in the uh, space. And then that team will clearly drive and project manage the whole process from, from A to Z, from you know starting those discussions all the way to signing the deal, closing it, and then even maybe managing the portfolio mm. uh, uh, with for, for you know as as you uh, become partners. But then also important is how strong are you are your is your governance? Once you start adding subsidiaries and different companies in different countries, do you have the right governance, whether it's legal, even financial, uh, to ensure that you are bringing those companies in the right way? Um, three, and this is where we c- we're going to come and knock on your doors a lot, uh, Mr. Karim, is looking at how do we integrate them strategically? Then, right? They are doing their own thing, and we know that we bought them for that reason, and we want co- them to continue to succeed. But maybe you can help me out here and say, how do we look at um, ensuring that th- there's synergy in strategic planning? We're planning things together, we're on the same path, right? And then you and I <coughs> continue talking about that uh, continuously. I think it starts before we even, uh, sometimes we start discussing about these targets before we even approach them, yeah. right? When we have an idea and we start talking about it, me and you, 
uh, about, okay, does it fit first in our overall, overall strategy? Does it make sense? Does it overlap? Will it cannibalize our current operations? And then based on that, we start understanding if this is a good fit or not. So before we even approach them, uh, I know we sit a lot together and discuss some of these potential targets and even partnerships, right? Mm -hmm. It's not only about acquisition. There's also some strategic partnerships that make sense beyond our ecosystem, right? Whatever we are, we want to look at, you know, does it make sense to go in a strategic partnership with, with this kind of uh, companies? Um, and then when, when things start to be in motion and, you know, the deal is being structured, uh, we start discussing a bit more details about which direction we want to take because that would impact also the deal uh, structure, but also what we want to do with that company. Um, so we talk a lot uh, throughout the process. Uh, I know we touch base on a regular basis and, and it's, it's a good conversation to have because it's important that we align on what we need to do for them mm -hmm. to grow and consequently help us, right? Because at the end of the day, grow, we grow and together we're one happy family. So, so, so it's something that I continue to look when we were looking at the current ones that we're dealing or future ones. And I know I keep pressing on you for, for the next batch because there's certain things that I want to see. Yeah. But uh, I know it's a continuous back and forth and it's very important for the organic growth person, which is me, and the inorganic person, that is you, to continuously discuss what do we need exactly. to make this a successful... Exactly. It doesn't have to be an integration, but at least addition yeah. to, the, to the family. Correct. and Because we get asked a lot from those potential or lead or prospects, uh, what are we adding as, as live, Correct. right? So like, what do you bring to the table? Uh, money is abundantly available everywhere. Exactly. So what does live bring as a strategic investor to help those founders and that team achieve what they're achieving, grow and realize a bigger upside, if not the same upside as outside? Um, so that answer is very important, right? And you and I continue to discuss how do we you know, it's in that synergy, right, where we benefit and they benefit, and that's very important. And that is honestly, you'd be surprised how valuable that is to companies. Yeah. Uh, they need to make sure that they are partnering with the right person, the right company, the right team, entrepreneurial, uh, strategic, and and that adds value and you know can help them and enable them to do what what they feel is uh, is the next few steps. Correct. So that's super important. You have to have the, the operational strength internally. Because that's when you, that's where you can help those companies uh, elevate their their uh, performance and ensure again from a governance point of view, from reporting, from ma overall management that all this is being cohesive, all this is being coherent to the market, to your investors, to your shareholders, and to the employees that hey, these acquisitions make sense because they are doing X, Y, Z as you build it. Do you, I mean, well, while we're talking about it now, I'm just thinking. Uh, is there a risk on the acquirer, the, the company that is acquiring, to get too distracted by acquisitions and get lost on their current organic growth? Is that something that people should pay attention to? Look, it's always a risk, I think. And, you know, it's always a fine balance between how management is allocating attention and resources to organic versus inorganic. So, and every investment carries risk, right? From uh, buying a share on the stock market all the way to, of course, investing in private companies and, and real estate. But yeah, important to keep that balance and keep that sync between uh, organic and inorganic, or inorganic. Because in my opinion, inorganic in strategic investing is always complementing the organic. Um, sometimes things come up and you might need to pivot. So, would an inorganic or an investment or an acquisition make sense? Yes, because it's a quicker way to pivot. And then the organic follows that. So that becomes your organic route, mm. if you mm. see, see what I mean. Yeah, it's, a, yeah, yeah. it's a flip. Yeah. But still, the organic has to be strong there because that's um, you know, the way you set the strategy is you say, okay, now we need to go into this or that, or I need to start farming. And today we're farming wheat. We're going to get into barley. Right, so does it make sense to go buy a, f a barley farm? Maybe, yeah. because yeah. that's quicker than um, just doing your own farming in the first year or two years and learning it uh, on the go. Maybe if we go to go back to the market, 
right, and the ecosystem that we work on. What do you think is the latest now trends of like acquisitions, strategic partnerships? So if you look from the time of order all the way to delivery, there's quite a lot of things that happen for, for listeners. Um, wh where do you think now is the focus going in terms of what are we, is there something we're now buying more or not interested anymore? Or uh, you hear a lot in the market, right? I mean, you hear about some deals happening, um, some of them are pure tech, some of them are a combination of tech and, and e-commerce or a combination of logistics, but what's your sense there? Yeah. So let's try to break it down into a few pieces. First piece is you have the, the mega growth of all the aggregator business, right? A lot of F&B demand, a lot of restaurants, a lot of uh, tra transactions coming through that side of things. The, the, the aggregators grew the sector a lot right. and, and with the pandemic this was multiplied clearly because people were sitting at home and ordering food at home so that sector just exploded and it grew a lot and it's it's good for everyone I assume um, with that it attracted a lot of funding that came in um, to again fund that growth and invest and capitalize on that growth and then you have you look at the restaurants and the brands also growing and multiplying and then you have the service providers who wanted to also be part of that growth, providing services to aggregators, to delivery companies, or to uh, the restaurants themselves. So if you break it up, there's, there's multiple service, service providers and startups coming up and offering things from order generation to order management to eventually the delivery component. Uh, so so if a lot happening and all these funds, exceptional, you know, record funds are coming and pouring into the space because that's still a growing space. And if you have a look at the peripheral side of groceries, you know, you're, you're still even bigger than as you combine those two. Clearly, there's a lot of players and I don't know if all of them will be around if you look back, you know, five years from now. Um, so is there opportunity for consolidation? Yes. Will there be a few big ones coming up and, and, and growing and being independent? Definitely. But you know, I don't think funding will continue to be uh, as abundant or as aggressive or as uh, uh, risk-taking for for forever, right? That you have cycles, and as funding you know becomes a bit more prudent and careful with certain success stories or failure stories, there you might see some consolidation, and and you'll you'll see things balancing out uh, differently. So based on that, I mean, you hear, again, when you hear on the news about all these deals happening in our region here, right? Uh, some tech companies coming together because they think now they, they can play in, the, in that ecosystem together. So the question is always, will there be enough deals, right? I mean, at, at some point, everybody's going to buy each other or someone is going to consolidate and you'll end up with like a duopoly. Is that, is that something that could happen in our region? I mean, or is it something that's very far? I don't think I would worry about that. I mean, if you have so much funding coming in and you have so many talented, uh, entrepreneurially driven people coming on this market base and, and trying to tackle opportunities, I don't think you'll, you'll end up having a duopoly or a monopoly anymore. Uh, will you have a few bigger players in the space? Yes. Clearly, and that's what you see with maybe maybe ride hailing or older indices like logistics or supply chain. But you can still see disruptors coming up and and taking their own kind of piece of the pie uh, and growing quickly and becoming unicorns because they're tackling certain problems that the incumbents couldn't tackle or the internationals or multinationals couldn't tackle while the locals ones are able to uh, to, uh, to capture in a much more innovative, creative, faster way. So that will always happen as long as there's innovation, as long as there's a technology and technology keeps improving and, and, and behavior keeps evolving, you'll see more and more uh, innovation coming online. So deal flow isn't an issue, but what you should worry about is, like I mentioned earlier, valuations. That's mm -hmm. always going to be yeah. uh, something you need to manage for as a strategic investor because there's so much liquidity out there chasing uh, the right companies. And right we've, we've seen some crazy valuations out there, right? Yeah, a lot yeah. of them uh, went either public or uh, with very, very high multiples. So, I mean, I, I, in my opinion, that's not very sustainable. At, at some point, things will, will not crash, but correct themselves because 
it's as you said liquidity crunch will go down and then at some point you know everybody will just go down to earth and yeah. evaluate this in a more sustainable way yeah i mean we're not we're not public equity experts exactly. neither of us is but you can see how how valuations have been have been really compressed in the last uh, couple of months so may- maybe if we talk now about what we're doing at live right so from your kind of perspective like what are we exactly are we trying to do i mean i, I know from growth i mean if, if i take from what i'm doing is i'm always looking at growth going into new markets new products um, and i'm always focused on organic and trying to get you know our the company bigger and bigger so what are you what's your take like what are you thinking about like in from from the inorga- inorganic side yeah so i think yeah based on the efforts of of the team and you guys have done a great job on this i think we're able to crystallize and we have a very clear idea of what the thesis is right from and we know what where we play we play between the order to delivery and everything in between for the ecosystem whether it's uh, uh, food or e-commerce anything that that falls within that spectrum is 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 where we're trying to uh, capture so having done so well on an organic side and having perfected the playbook having the right team the experience the and and, and the and the know-how i think we're, we're very confident to go and say now we're able to go and partner with with good companies so what i'm looking to do and what you know what me and the team are doing now is um ensuring we identify good companies that fit in where we are trying to operate and continue to capture uh, growth uh, to help complement the strategy, so if you find a an order management player in Europe or or in Middle East, of course, or Asia, or if you find you know if you find something that can help us add more solutions to our restaurant customers, uh, these are companies that we're trying to identify, and then we are you know clearly running all these conversations at the moment and ensuring we are building a good solid pipeline for investments and partnerships. So we're also open for partnerships, as you know, to ensure we, we build that ecosystem in a good way, in a solid way that becomes unique, becomes uh, different, and of course, very valuable for our uh, customers. I mean, so I mean, so this is important, right? I mean, I, we when we look at the whole strategy of growing, um, the ecosystem of order to delivery is quite large also not only about restaurants and groceries but also if you look at the e-commerce the parcels like quite a lot of sectors are now into that and when we started doing this whole growth we noticed right away how um, a lot of new companies are coming up with very disruptive ideas um, that would change the way we receive our orders Uh, for example you know drone deliveries and automation robots sure you've seen these um and also at the same time it's it's it seems to be a bit of a challenge for everybody to make their place in the market between you know these large marketplaces the brands uh now with the whole trend of uh, ghost kitchens and ghost uh stores you you see a lot of things popping out right and left and as growth in the company, we're trying to always have an eye on, you know, what is going to be the next thing in the market. Is there something you feel is the next thing that, you know, we should be looking at? I mean, from a, like looking five years ahead, is there anything that we know is slowly becoming very, very interesting? Yes, yeah, so some of the trends maybe we can, we keep in mind as we look for, you know, the like the medium term, let's not say it's very short term, you want to keep an eye out on the autonomous technology out there, right? Can we capture autonomous into our own ecosystem? Is that really happening? I mean, I we hear about it. I mean, I, I've been hearing about it for the past, I think, 10 years, yeah. right? I mean, on and off, and then you hear about some accidents and then yeah. things like step back. Yeah, hello, it, autonomous can come in different ways, right? It could be a robot in the building that goes up the elevator, walks, you know, rolls over to your uh, apartment, okay. knocks the door and gives you a shipment, right? That would be creepy. That's sure. creepy, <laughs> but it's super convenient and it, you know, takes a lot of efficiency out so from from a driver on the bike, right? So driver maybe can deliver it to that robot in the building and 
the building if it's you know 80 floors and that's very common in Dubai, the robot can take care of that and that's autonomous, right? Okay. Um, you can look at uh, things you know more autonomy and on the operational side. So can we handle uh, more packages and uh, more deliveries on on and the fulfillment side? With more AI and and uh, to to uh, to enhance the the capacity and to enhance the capability and the quality of delivery and you know and reduce errors, so autonomous comes in different ways. So autonomous is one okay. one definitely important uh, trend to keep an eye out for um, green and and the impact on the environment is also uh, crucial as we all face the certain scenarios and we all work um, and this is big for us in the UAE of course as you know in terms of ensuring we are transforming things into greener and more sustainable uh, operations and then i would i would also look at you know what what the consumers are are looking to do right the consumer is is more mobile the consumer is not going to be stuck in an office you know between 9 to 6 every day um, the consumer is le- using the kitchen less they're cooking less uh, they're shopping more online and this will continue right uh, how does it evolve? I think we'll have to see and, and, and stay close to that and design solutions for our you know, customers that help enable meet that uh, trend and, 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 and be there. Uh, I think there will continue to be liquidity. There will continue to be a lot of innovation, connectivity. Um, power of networks will be even bigger. So capturing all these together, I think you, know, you have a lot of exciting uh, things coming up and then we'll make sure we, uh, we capture them together. Now, talking about kind of the companies out there, right, that are at different stages of their growth. Some of them have just started. Some of them are like at a certain stage growing regionally and then globally. We, we look at growth, right? All the time we're obsessed about how do we grow year on year? How do we make self, how do we keep relevant, stay relevant at the market? And um, from my team, right, I always am at the lookout at you know, again, markets, products, disruptive that might come and, you know, pull the rug under us on some key products or markets. And obviously, inorganic growth comes into play here. So what do you what do you think about that? Yeah, look, th- there's two sides to that deal, right? There's a seller and a buyer. So to the sellers, I would say, clearly there's lots of opportunities out there. You know, if you're building a company, you're building a team, you're building a business model, and then you, you eventually you want to exit, and that's completely fine. Uh, you know, almost every company has an exit at some point in its time, or maybe more than one exit even. So for those guys, yeah, definitely, your strategy is to is to stay close to what's going on, build the business, build the team, and make it um, attractive for someone to come invest in it or or buy it out. So that's one side. The other side, if you are you know, looking to grow and start acquiring and grow further by acquiring or inorganically expand, make sure you understand exactly why you're doing it. Uh, what will it achieve? Again, is it geographic? Is it, is it product? Is it a pivot? Is it, you know, is it complementing? So be very clear about that and be very clear about you know, how do you know what to do with that partnership post deal and how do you handle that partnership how you handle that uh, acquisition that investment once everything is signed and the ink is uh, dry um, don't get caught up in, in hype a lot of you know m a can sound very uh, appealing and can sound very uh, interesting it, it is it's a, it's a it brings a lot of value it's a lot of fun to do but it also can be very very risky to companies so unless you have the right team and the right fundamentals in the business organically uh, don't go about starting you know looking at buying companies until you have that internal strength and, and readiness to to be acquiring businesses great um well that was that was a very interesting conversation i yeah. hope everyone had um, benefit from all the insights uh, related to acquisitions Thank you, Nader, for being our first guest of this podcast. Pleasure. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please reach out on our website or leave a comment on our social media platforms. I know this was a very interesting podcast for me, uh, the first time I ever am a host, so I hope it went well. Um, And stay tuned for the next episode. 
Thank you, everyone. Thank you.